Yeah. I turned you on. Okay. All right. Good evening. My name is Carolyn White, and I'm the president of League of Women Voters, Park Rapids. And welcome, and thank you for all that came out tonight. We've got a very important topic about this interleague project to help keep our Mississippi River healthy. Park Rapids residents have always had a vital interest in the waters that surround us, and not just for drinking water either. Our economy is built on clean water. The League of Women Voters Park Rapids is a nonpartisan volunteer organization whose mission is to encourage informed and active participation in government, which we have a few extras that are participating tonight, so we have to divide our time. We influence public policy through education and advocacy, which includes supporting activities that preserve the nation's natural resources. Programs are always free and open to the public. If you're interested in other league events, please indicate that on the sign-up sheets that you saw when you came in. There's also brochures about league membership, and ask any of the league members here tonight. All are welcome to join, men, women, citizens, non-citizens, etc. Take a flyer about, uh, take a look at the flyers about upcoming events. On Saturday, there's the current event, events book club that meets at Beagle Books, and a copy of the current books out on the table. Our annual, May, um, annual meeting is May 11th at Bella Cafe. And this is a good way to find out what league's all about and what we're going to plan for the next year and help us plan. There's also a discussion on mental health services that will be held on May 23rd. So more of that coming out in the papers. I think everybody knows there's cookies, coffee, and tea in the back. Um, there's a free will donation bowl back there if you can help us out with some costs. Everyone knows the bathrooms is back behind us here, and you want to silence your cell phones, and at the end of the program, please fill out your evaluations. You can leave it on the sign-up table. And I want to say a special thank you to ba Beth Baker Canoodala for arranging the program, and to Sharon Ansel for organizing all of our workers. And Beth, it's, uh, I'll turn it over to you, and you can introduce our speakers, Gretchen Sable and Julie Kingsley. Good evening. Tonight's program will introduce you to a new group generated out of the League of Women Voters and centered around the health of the Mississippi River. Now just over a year old, the Upper Mississippi River Region Interleague Organization is working to educate and advocate around the needs of the Mississippi River. Tonight we're most happy to have the chair of the Upper Mississippi River Region ILO with us, Gretchen Sable from Andover. Uh, now retired employee of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, traveler, ABC League of Women Voters member, that's Anoka Blaine in Coon Rapids, <laughs> and grandmother, as many of us are, um, will speak to us about the ILO and what we might do to improve water quality on the Mississippi River. Uh, Gretchen's presentation will be followed by Julie Kingsley, our local leader with the Soil and Water Conservation District. Julie has been a longtime advocate of clean water COLA member, worked on the Straight River Groundwater Study, and resident of Akeley. Julie will be speaking to what is happening in Hubbard County, including work just being completed by the Minnesota PCA on water quality in the Headwaters region. We welcome you both, and thank you very much for coming this evening. Thanks. Okay. Are we good here? Yeah. You have to hold it close. I have to hold it close. <laughs> um, so, how is the Mississippi and why should we care? We are, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, whoops, the interleague organization first, because that's really a, an odd sounding title. Basically, um, you know, we're all used to local leagues, and then there's a state league, and then there's these interleague organizations. They were added to the formal structure of LWBUS in 1972 because there's things that don't fit within a political boundary. And so by having these kind of super leagues, there's ways to have league address issues. Um, this is a, a, a diagram that I thought was wonderful, but other people find a little busy. So basically you have local leagues, you have state leagues, 
in LWB US, and that's the dark lines. This blue box here is the ILO because we actually we pick up local leagues in the Mississippi watershed. We pick up the state leagues, the four state leagues in our area, and then we're actually organized under LWB US. And so we kind of operate at this different level. Um, and we are organized around a single purpose, and that's the water of the Mississippi and its tributaries. So um, we're different than a lot of leagues, but that's okay. There are other ILOs. This Council of Metropolitan Area ILO is um, the CMAL. You may have heard of that if you're working with league at the Minnesota level. CMAL is this Council of Metropolitan Area leagues. So a lot of the Twin Cities leagues pay into that. And then there's this Lake Michigan ILO, which I'll talk about a little bit more. This is the 45, I think, counties surrounding Lake Michigan. And they got together a while back. They're, they were, just had their 40th anniversary. And a lot of what they addressed at the beginning was planning issues. You know, when you think about all the industry along the shores here and all those things, there was a lot going on in this area that was really affecting the lake. And so they organized around the lake to work on planning issues. Now they also work on water quality issues. That's their, um, the woman on the left there with her head down is <laughs> Hank Saunders, Henrietta Saunders. She's on the U.S. LWBUS board now. She's the treasurer of LWBUS, but she had been the head of the Lake Michigan ILO. So basically what had happened was some people in the Mississippi watershed, if you think of Illinois, I don't have a map of Illinois. Illinois actually borders on the Mississippi on the west and Lake Michigan on the east. And See here, see how this is such a little thin watershed? Do you know why? They get their water from Lake Michigan, but they changed around the flow of the Chicago River. So instead of coming into Lake Michigan, it goes to the Ohio, or to the Mississippi. Anyhow, it goes into our watershed. So they excrete into the Mississippi watershed, and they drink from the Lake Michigan watershed. So they're an, an interesting group, and they, um, people, I keep forgetting which way to turn the wheel. There we go. Um, that, that group had kind of formed the model, and people in the Mississippi River watershed saw that model and they thought we should try that. So they worked to organize it, took a few years, and um, that's how we got involved. So at our first annual meeting, this was October of 2015, we picked nutrient pollution as our program focus. And we're going to talk about what is nutrient pollution. That's something that you guys up here know quite a bit about from various kinds of activities that are happening up here. Basically, nutrient pollution is too much of a good thing. Um, it's phosphorus and nitrogen. Those are things that when you do fertilizer, you know it's NPK. So that's the first two things in, in fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer is made from ammonia. And that's probably more than you want to know about anhydrous. But um, basically, it's a, a synthetic way of taking nitrogen from the air and making it into fertilizer. Phosphorus fertilizer comes from mine materials containing phosphorus, also from manure and animal byproducts and human waste. So there's a lot of sources of these and they're essential for plants and they have to put them onto farm fields and our yards so that they get nice. But basically it's too much of a good thing. So we want to keep the nutrients that we like to eat, but we don't want the nutrients in our water. We don't want all that green water. Um, National Geographic picked this up and said it's a modern miracle. You know, modern agriculture is a modern miracle. The Green Revolution, that was, there were Nobel Prizes. This is a whole big deal to have, to be able to grow so much food, but it comes at a cost. And so what we have is this runaway nitrogen, suffocating wildlife, contaminating groundwater, and warming, warming the climate. Um, I don't know, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this, but basically there's dead zones that are created. So when all these nutrients flood into a water body, if there's not enough change in that water body, the algae grows, the algae dies, and in decomposition it uses up all the oxygen. So there's dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, where the Mississippi comes down. There's a dead zone in Green Bay, the bay itself of Green Bay, because remember Dora County sticks out into Lake Michigan. Well, that bay is more isolated, and so there's not the turnover of water in there, and that's another dead zone. So there's dead zones all around. There's been a lot of work going on. You guys can probably recognize your watershed up here. This is the, what's the, yeah, this is the upper Mississippi up here. 
This is the Crow Wing River watershed. And so what they've done is they've modeled, this is phosphorus, they've modeled where the phosphorus is coming from. And you can see that it's primarily our corn regions that are the great contributors there, nitrogen as well. But this is the 2002 model. Do you know, Julie, has the 2012 model come out yet? I think so. Yeah, they update this model every 10 years. And this is a slide I did a couple years ago. So, um, so anyhow, the, we know where it's coming from now. We know what the sources are. And we know that we need to start doing stuff about it. On May 6th, the ILO is having our second annual meeting. We're going to meet in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And we have a lot of good... Um, uh, stable, that's not the right word, <laughs> speakers. We're going to have the mayor of La Crosse as our welcoming speaker. And he is part of a group that actually is working on climate change. And so they, um, he went to Paris for the climate talks there last year. And he's part of a group of mayors along the Mississippi working on water quality issues. Heidi Keeler with Fishers and Farmers, that's a USDA program that works cooperatively with farmers. We have Howard Lerner from the Environmental Law and Policy Institute. He's our keynote. And when you look at Howard, Kim Wright, and Mark Borchard, what's happened is the ability of people to interact with their government is becoming stifled. <laughs> stifled. Yes. And um, Howard Lerner with the ELPI um, watches this kind of on a regional basis. They're the eight states that include our four, the upper Midwest. Kim Wright with Midwest Environmental Advocates has been working with some of our members in the La Crosse area because in Wisconsin, government was not responsive to people's concerns about problems. And so they actually had to bring in help from nonprofits to sue and to do things to get government to take action. And that was things where groundwater was being contaminated and there wasn't a government response to help people. And this Mark Borchard with the Laboratory for Infectious Disease was one of the ones that was doing the testing to show that the groundwater was contaminated. Um, so this is our, our day, our Saturday day program on May 6th. In the evening, we're going to have a happy hour with Gretchen Benjamin. She's a director with the Nature Conservancy, and she's going to talk about Mississippi River restoration projects in the area. We have a business plan. And we're going to be looking at partnering for advocacy. Um, some of the things that we're working on relate to the U.S. Farm Bill, the Federal Farm Bill. And we as Minnesota have much less of a voice than we as the ILO. And if the four states work together, and then we work with the four states around Lake Michigan, and then there's um, another group around Lake Erie. And so we all have the same issues. It's all the nutrients from farm fields that are uh, hitting the water is creating these algae blooms and creating a problem. So I hope that we will approve at this meeting um, a stronger approach. And Beth's coming, so thank you. Um, we, we hope that all of our member leagues, we have, I didn't say that, we have 60 member leagues. 60? 60, is that still right? 60, you said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we had 60. Not everybody's re-upped yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's been doing the totals. So if, if anybody's watching this and was a league that has not paid yet, we would certainly welcome that. But um, <laughs> of these 60 leagues, we hope everybody sends a representative so that we can actually have a legal business meeting and all that. Oh, yeah. Oh. Hang on. I've got a, a screen thing here. In show. Um, the ILO has different ways that we communicate with people. This is our website, www.umrr.org. So on our website, we have basic organization information. We have information about our annual meeting. We have posted the LWD positions for the U.S. and all of our four states, and that's what we take action under. And then we have a blog. And on the blog, we have probably three to four articles a month come on. And what we try to do, sometimes we have guest authors, sometimes I'm the guest author. We'll pick a topic, and then we'll actually research different sources, and we'll have links. And so you can learn a lot about a topic by reading our blogs. This one, um, City of Des Moines sued the counties to the north because there was so much nitrogen coming down the river that they had to spend millions of dollars for extra treatment. 
and the judge just summarily dismissed that lawsuit. And so you can read about that on our website, our blog. This is another one that's an interesting story about nitrate. Um, Iowa has been doing a lot of research on nitrate and its effects with, on people. There was a study that was done, a long-term study, over 20 years, looked at 2,200 2, women that were drinking water, and these women lived in the same place long enough that they knew that you know, they were mostly drinking water with this kind of nitrogen level because cities monitor that. And so they found that with even levels, the drinking water standard is 10 for nitrogen, but at a quarter of that, there was still a two to three fold increase in bladder, ovarian, and thyroid cancers. Oh, wow. That there was a significant increase in spina bifida, limb deficiencies, and cleft palate. So pregnant women were affected too. And that was even if you were drinking water for only a few months. And so, you know, what we are able to do because we have this multi-state focus, the nitrate studies in Iowa are something that we're not hearing a lot about in Minnesota, but in Iowa, they're talking about a lot in their public health circles. And so we're able to pick up on those things and advertise those as well. This is our website. This is our Facebook page. It's our Facebook page. Um, so that's where, if you want to find us on Facebook, it's LWB, Upper Mississippi River Region Interleague Organization, which everybody says, I can pick that, that's too long. <laughs> um, so that's, that, I said, well, that's our name. Um, so anyway, so that's what it is. We're, right now we're advertising our annual meeting. That's that leadership thing. But if you like us on Facebook, we put links to current events too. So we, got, we have the blog where we have the more developed stories and then the newspaper articles and things like that show up on the Facebook page. Um, anybody know where Joe Davies County is? Anybody know who Joe Davies was? Yeah. He was a general in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. and so he got a county in Illinois named after him. And that's the Galena area. So um, oh. Galena, Illinois is just across from Dubuque. It's in the northwest corner of Illinois. They have been, they were kind of the mothers of the ILO. And they are doing a lot of different work. They have um, education things that they do. They do stream monitoring and spring monitoring. They um, put on public forums on water quality. They actually had a well sealing program. You know, here in Minnesota, well sealing is done through the Board of Water and Soil. And this is an example of a well that we probably wouldn't ever see in Minnesota. It was actually in a pit. Um, but they're paying to seal wells through grants. And so they they got involved in a lot of stuff. They have a speaker come and talk about the Illinois nutrient loss strategy. Um, and then they formed this water planning committee. Now, for those of us that have been doing water planning in Minnesota, it's like, well, well boy, was that original. You know, we've been doing that for a long time. But it was original for them. And it's something that wasn't institutionalized in Illinois like it is here. And so they were able to get this group together. And because League is a good neutral convener in a lot of ways, you know, people tend to trust us. They will come and participate because they know that both sides of the story will be shown. They were able to get all these different groups together to work on a plan for water quality. So they've been very successful with that. Um, this is some of the stuff they've been working on, impaired water bodies, science assessment, large landowner BMPs, community BMPs. So they've been very successful at that. The other thing that they started doing, let me get a slide about. Um, they started working with the Rotary Club. Do you guys have Rotary Clubs here? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, so they have this partnership with Rotary. And they put on a, a um, conference in January where Rotary people came in, lead people. And we're starting to look for places where we can pair a league with a rotary to work on water issues. Um, so that's something that they spawned there and we're hoping to pick up on. They got a grant to do more spring testing. They got a grant to clean up parts of the Galena River. Galena uh, means lead. So they did lead mining there. Um, and a long time ago, during the Civil War. They got a grant for um, the watershed game. What did you say about the watershed game? Yeah. Oh, Duluth. Duluth, Duluth, Duluth yeah. has been trained. Yeah, so you guys have probably all done the watershed game. I'm looking at Julie. Is it something that has been spread around the community sure. here? We, Maybe a little yes. bit. It was yeah. a few yeah. years ago. It was really yeah. big. 
Yeah, do we still have trained facilitators up here? I So Julie might be interested if anyone would play the game. It basically, you're simulating a watershed and then everybody has to trade for improvements in the watershed. It's a good way to have discussions with people. Um, that was another thing that when they found that, it was like, really, you just found that? <laughs> We've been doing that in Minnesota a long time. But that it's, um, it's really, a lot of people enjoy it, and it's been a good tool to have these discussions. And so, again, if we're working with a Rotary Club, we can work with them to put this on and reach out to them to all the Rotary people and all the people in their network, and, and on it goes. Um, what can you as a local league do? And Julie's going to help us on knowing your watershed and then helping others know your watershed. Um, what's your HUC? That's something, that's the hydrologic unit code, which is an eight-digit code for the watershed that you're in, those shapes I was showing you. Not that you need to know that number, but you need to understand that you're part of this discrete area and all the water there. Is there impaired waters in your watershed? What plans are in place for improvement? What watershed districts or water management organizations can you work with? So those are things that as a local league, if you understand the, the water regulatory framework and the water monitoring framework, that then you can help out when there's problems. And you know where the leverage points are. So when you have a concern, you would know who to go talk to. So those are good. I just put up, for example, the Crow Ring River watershed. This was on the PCA website, I think. Yeah. Um, we do, we're working on public education through the watershed game. Many trained facilitators, um, you can host your elected officials. I think the idea had been originally that uh, every time there's a new crop of elected officials, right, you play the game with them. Um, so that's a, a thing you can do, partner with other organizations, Rotary, you can go into schools. It's a really good tool for having those kinds of discussions. Um, you can have speakers on topics of local concern. There's watershed education coordinators, SWCD speakers. This Sam Bauer, do you guys know him? <laughs> He's a turf guy at the U of M. And he has a lot of really good talks that tell you how to have a healthier lawn with less fertilizer and water inputs. So like, um, if you water your grass deeply and infrequently, you get roots. If you water shallow every day, the grass adapts to that kind of a water regime and just have little unhealthy roots. So, and you can see that if you cut it lower, then the roots are little, if you cut it higher. Um, I was, she said I was a grandma. I was, we were doing kind of the uh, three inch level, which was almost, almost the unclipped level. And my poor little toddler grandsons kept falling over because their little feet would get stuck <laughs> in the grass. <laughs> And the same with my league friends who don't pick their feet up. <laughs> so you may want to think about that. But, you know, cutting it higher really does help quite a bit. I live on the Anoka Sand Plain, and our lawn is very droughty. But since we started adopting some of these practices, it's helped it quite a bit. You can also sign up for citizen monitoring. You can do it individually, or you can do it as a league. You know, the Joe Davies people, they did it as a league. And so they have ways that they work together to get that work done. And that's a good thing. Again, this is something that Julie will talk more about, but um, the Pollution Control Agency has a schedule for the monitoring of watersheds. And so, let's see, what was the upper Mississippi done? It's not done yet, it's just finishing. Oh, well they started in 2013. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes like four years. Yeah. So, you know, these things are, on a schedule and be, and be aware of those and know that it's happening and think about, think about that. Because counties also do water plans. So this shows Hubbard County, you guys are doing it. 2016, 20, 26. Uh, you just finished yeah. in 2016, right? Yeah. So they have 10 years, so 2026. Anybody here from Cass County, they're probably wrapping up soon yep. here. Yep. There's this Beltrami as well. Review. Oh. Yeah. So, there is a five year, at five year we go and look at it again mm -hmm. and see if things need to be changed, what we've achieved, what we haven't achieved. And so, okay. you know, there will be public meetings where we are asking for public input. That's another place that you really can get involved and yeah. we really appreciate you doing that. Because mm -hmm. you know it better out there than you know. Yeah. I do. Yeah, so that's something you'll want to participate in too. Um, this is my little Y League. Um, 
we have a lot of common issues that unite all the leagues, all 60 of these leagues, from the headwaters to, we're going all the way into Illinois, you know, where the Ohio River comes in at the bottom of Illinois, that's our territory. And so those 60 leagues were all affected by nutrients flowing into the Gulf. We all contributed that dead zone. We all have railroads going through here and pipelines and all these things that are issues. We have aquatic invasive species, commercial navigation, the need to do ecosystem restoration, flood risk management, you know, all these things unite us as these. And so, this is, I like this. From the spirit of the women's suffrage movement came a great idea that a nonpartisan civic organization could promote active and informed citizen participation. So this is Carrie Chapman Cap. She was one of our founders of League of Women Voters. Um, and we see that the chief benefit of our organization, which we call the UMR, being the ability to amplify the voices of our citizens across dozens of congressional districts. And so that's what I'm hoping that we're going to be able to start stepping up for in our second year. Um, do you want to do a while? And then I can, I can talk about legislation, st legislative things if people want to talk about that, what's going on in Minnesota. It's really important. Do you want me to do that first? Sure. Okay. I'm going to skip over a few of these slides and oh, here we go. Um, Beth had put out some articles in the back. So you guys all know how a bill becomes law, right? And I don't need to talk about that. Basically, there was a bunch of small bills that came into the legislature this year that were going to um, undo parts of our environmental protections. And so those all ended up getting, well, not all, but a number of them got rolled into an omnibus bill. And so Ron Medor, I think is how you say, Medor, um, used to work for the Tribune, now he writes for the Post. And he wrote a very good article where he interviewed Whitney Clark. There's some organizations that we work with. Friends of the Mississippi is um, focused on the Mississippi in the Twin Cities. Um, did you know that the Mississippi, as it goes to the Twin Cities, there's actually a national park along the banks of that river. And so the Friends of the Mississippi work with the National Park in the Twin Cities, between where the Crow comes in at the north and the St. Crow, or the St. Croix. Anyhow, well, Whitney said, we effectively have no foreseeable federal backstop for the next few years, so we can't look to the feds to hold us up if we fall. <coughs> Combined with likely major cuts to funding that our own state environmental agencies are gonna get from the federal government, and now we have all these cuts coming at the state level as well. And really, you know, we, we have a budget surplus. Why do we need to have a cut? Add to that, we now have this full frontal assault on Minnesota's pretty decent bedrock protection, protections for clean water, environmental review, and a host of other values that have been in, some pla in, been in place in some cases since the 70s. And Whitney says, what's going on can set us back a generation in terms of the progress that we've made. So this is a a grim time for environmental legislation. Steve Morse is um, a former legislator, former deputy, I think, commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, and he's now the head of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership. And he says, The other thing I think is scary. Yeah. <laughs> no, really. Well, really, no, really. Yeah, what he's talking about here is that there's not a chance for people to speak. And I think that when we're thinking about what lead can do, this is what league should focus on. This lack of process, the lack of transparency. Um, you know, we saw it when the Democrats were in charge too. Bills would come up at the last minute and they would be written and they would have things that nobody ever heard of. And where did that come from? How could that get into a conference bill? Because the decisions were made at night. And so the bills are set before anybody ever sees them and the committees don't really work on the bills. The testimony is perfunctory. They have to allow some public participation, so they do a boom, 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 two minutes each. Oftentimes, no questions or dialogue. Let's move along. Did you guys see? Yep. <laughs> yeah, Melissa Hortman's yeah. tirade. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ron Medor again wrote, "There's the energy bill, where a pipeline with a pipeline provision that would prevent the kind of state review that ultimately led Enbridge to abandon the Sandpiper project." And Steve Morse again said. You want to talk about a way to create massive civil disobedience? Pipeline companies have eminent domain authority to condemn and put a pipeline through your land. One of the checks on that was that they had to go to the PUC and get a certificate of deed. 
the energy bill takes away that process, so they don't have to make a case for a new line to anybody anymore. Whitney says, thank God for Mark, I hear people saying, thank God for Mark Dayton, he can stop this. And obviously he has a veto pen, and a Republican majority in the Senate is just one seat, and we've seen in the past that the governor can't stop everything. And he's got his own big agenda, so that means that he's going to have to trade if he wants to make accomplishments. He's going to have to make some trades. So we can't count on him for everything. Um, and then they're looking to the next, legis you know, the next election to reverse some of these excesses. But again, Whitney sums it up. Even in a better political period for the environment, it's going to be very difficult to put some of these things back in place. So things that fall now may not come back, or it'll be a fight. Um, some of the elements of the bills, they're trying to undo the buffer rules. I sat through one of the hearings early in the session, and they asked counties to come in and talk about how they were doing on implementing. I don't know, were you going to talk about that, Julie? Buffer uh, stuff? Not really, but... Yeah, so um, each of the counties had to create an inventory of buffers for their county. And then the counties came in, and Bowser, Board of Water, and Soil talked about how far people had gotten with that. And really, progress was pretty good. And there wasn't a lot of concern in most counties about meeting the standards in the Dayton's buffer laws, but there were some. And they're up in Fabian's district, up in northwest Minnesota, and places like that. And so they were there saying, oh, it's going to be so terrible. And so all these bills came in to delay or put back the buffer laws. They have um, <clears throat> weakening of clean water standards and enforcement in ways that violate federal requirements. They seem to invite a fight with Washington, except we don't think there's many people who are going to fight us in Washington right now, so I don't know how real that is. Um, limiting citizens' rights to challenge new mining permits. Doubling the size, oh, this, did you know about this? Um, right now, if your feedlot is over 1,000 animal units, you would have to do an environmental review. They want to change that to 2,000. Allowing corporations to do their own EISs. So that right now, an EIS is a very public process where the public's involved in scoping, this and this and this, and a lot of public review. With that, the corporation would do their own. They're not going to require the PCA to do health standards for frac sand mines anymore, which doesn't affect you guys too much. Undercutting local government's authority so that they can't have bans on plastic bags. And um, I'm pretty sure that townships up here have adopted moratoriums on certain kinds of development. What will happen is, you know, your townships is going along and they're grading the roads and whatever else townships do, and then suddenly some big development comes. And so they had a tool of being able to put a moratorium on development until they got their feet under them to say, is this what we want for our township? They want to take that away. Oh. Is that in an omnibus bill? It's it is in, it's in the House File 888. Um, they also are kind of, I've had a problem with the way people talk about things because we ran out of superlatives. You know, back when things were sort of bad, we were using the most hideous and disaster and things like that. And now they really are. We don't have words that haven't been overused, but we really are there. They're taking away the ability to, um, for agencies to write rules by having additional judicial review for water quality standards. So the agency, if you ever worked for a state agency and you wrote rules, it's a three to four year process with a lot of public input along the way and review by judges, and then they want to put this additional judicial review at the end where judges, not scientists, will determine if the science is set. Um, they want to have guidance. Oh, there's a lot of times too, you write a rule, and your rule might be outcome based. So I used to work in the septic program and we said you can either build it in these ways, or you can build it however you want, as long as it meets this outcome. And so then you might write some guidance to tell people how to get to that outcome. Well, now they're saying that if you have guidance, you have to make that a rule as well, so there wouldn't be guidance anymore. Um, they would have an expedited permitting process that would be required to start before environmental review is done. So that would be a challenge. Another bill that's bad is the legacy bill. So this is your sales tax dollars that we all voted for. And Our they, representative presented that bill. I mean, that's easy author. 
Well, the, 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 that would be representative green green um so anyhow this bill this is a an article from the strip by dennis anderson and that was the one that beth had there in the back basically he says that um what this bill does is it, it should be vetoed because it examines so that the, so the this lasard sam's council studiously examines things and and they come up with a recommendation and it's kind of a nice political or a public involved process but the house changed all those recommendations and they cut out parts of it and they kind of went their own way on it um, he said that counties would be able to proclaim no net gain of public land so that if, if they were to acquire additional public land some would have to be sold to the private sector and then they also took money from this clean water fund and they're using this head to cover the administrative costs of sorry julie <laughs> swcvs which is not the, what that law was for it was always meant to supplement not supplant and they're supplanting with this bill so what dennis anderson said was this should be vetoed and it'd be better to not spend the money to spend them to spend it wrong um i'm a member beth's a member of the LWB Minnesota Environmental Task Force. So this used to be the Action Committee. The Action Committee morphed into these task forces. Um, so all the omnibus bills except the legacy bill have passed both houses and they're headed to conference committee. There will be action alerts coming out and so we're going to ask you to take action on the action alerts when they come. Do you read the capital letter that comes out through League? That's a good... I think the capital letter is too infrequent. And I'm concerned about it because it's, you know, every three, two, two, three, four weeks, depending on when they get input and when they get it together and when it gets posted. So it's kind of old news, but that's a tool you can use to understand the background. You can join one of these task forces, and that's a really good way to stay involved because then you're, you're privy to lots of stuff. Um, you would respond to action alerts. April 19th, we're going to have Water Action Day. Where are you going? Am I talking about that? Are you talking about that? Um, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it at the end. Maybe okay. we can get okay. more information about it. Okay. That's good. This is um, it's our website again. Did you get that? Oops. LWBUMRR.org. That's our homepage. This is Minnesota Water Action Day. Oh, on the 18th. The Bloomington League is working in concert with Northfield, Dakota County, and the ILO to put on this pipeline thing. So there's going to be a pipeline talk on the night before Water Action Day. If you're coming to the Twin City early, you can participate in this. They'll have, um, they're going to have, they're going to talk about treaty rights, so they'll have a Native American focus, and talk about climate change. <coughs> They're looking at the Standing Rock movement and what's happening there. They're looking at kind of what people can do about pipelines. Kathy Hollander is a lobbyist working with MN350. And they're going to have a panel discussion. So that's going to happen in Bloomington at a church that I don't remember the name of, St. Stephen's something. But I can get you that. And so that's that. So there's a lot going on and a lot that you can be part of. And I hope that you are. So, I'll let Julie, do you want to find your stuff, Julie, or maybe sure. do something? Sure. And if anybody has some questions? Yeah, we can talk there. Yeah. You can get your sweaty mouse. <laughs> Are there any questions now? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if this is a question, but I really, uh, have, I really question whether or not the initial statement about the need in our food system for the night, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that we apply.